Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy, and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. And as always, another great guest. I actually met Kale. His name's Kale Goodwin. Good man. Not good Good man. man, Yeah. Thank you. Um, So I actually met him on Instagram because I was on another podcast. He saw me on Brad Lee's podcast, reached out, and was like, man, I love what you're doing. Love what you're, where you're going with this. Uh, I'd love to just see how, how we could add value to each other. So I'm grateful that he reached out because. Um, As somebody who's been an entrepreneur for a long time, taxes is one of the main things that people just screw up in their life. I had one client just recently matched him up with a a real estate tax person, and they're going to go back three years and refile and probably save my client um, close to thirty to fifty thousand dollars that they overpaid because they just didn't know what they were doing. They said, "Hey, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do it yourself." Or, well, that do it do it yourself or just got real expensive. And so um, that's what I love about this. So when we connected, it just seemed like a good fit to have him on here. But Kale, he came from a background of kind of hating the government. I feel like anybody who comes from a background of, of hatred or really distrust of something, oftentimes they end up, once they understand it, they end up really becoming an advocate. And it's not that you're an advocate for the IRS, but understanding what the IRS code is for can really um, shift your mentality and say, wow, I can actually add a lot of value if I can help other people have the same epiphany that I had. And so uh, what's cool about this is Kale, he's built an accounting firm for entrepreneurs specifically, and it's built by entrepreneurs. So he understands your business. He understands what you're going through. He understands all the ins and outs and, and how to make that streamlined and effective for you to, to maximize your profits and minimize your stress. Finances is the number one stress all over, business or in relationships. And if we can take that stress off, off of you and just give you some, some real actionable things that you can work on on a, on a quarterly basis and have everything in perfect order by the time t- tax season comes, then it's like you're not even thinking about it. You're not stressed about taxes. You know they're just going to get filed and it's going to happen. You're going to get what money is yours. You're going to pay what you owe. And it's all going to be planned for. And that's why yeah. Kale's on here today uh, because that's what he's creating for people. He's creating peace, time, joy, loyalty, um, and focus for you as a listener. And that's why I want him on here. So um, go ahead, Kale, and kind of give us an introduction. Tell us how you got into this space, what mm-hmm. was the transition, why you decided to become your own entrepreneur and build a legacy for yourself. Absolutely, man. I, I appreciate that introduction. And just to highlight on that a little bit like uh, that's I mean that's really what it comes down to is is those really those financial healthy habits and helping people create those because uh, like like you do like with people in their budgets and where they can save and all that stuff that's kind of what we do more focused around the taxes but it always does take some responsibility on the client's part and so we want to help them create those healthy habits and um, you know but yeah to jump into my my story a little bit um, I so I grew up my entire life, I can't even remember when it started because it went on for so long, but my childhood, there was a ton of like fighting in the home. The biggest issue was over money. And the reason is because my dad was a self-employed contractor and uh, he kept getting himself into further and further or a deeper and deeper hole, not only with his finances and his budgeting and his money management, but also with his taxes. And I just remember from as long, long as I can remember, I mean, maybe five, six year old, five, six years old, all the way until early adulthood when I left the home, my parents constantly fought about the IRS. Um, and so I grew up with this belief that the IRS ruined our life uh, because they, they, they like literally, they leaned my dad's home. 
they garnished his wages, they audited him, they did estimated taxes on him, they put taxes and penalties on top of it, uh, he, to the point where he could never get caught up based, you know, from what he was making, he could never like afford to live and get caught up from the, the debt that he got behind on. Um, and then my mom, she ends up going in and getting a job. Um, and within months, they garnish her paychecks. Um, the suppliers of my dad's contracting business get contacted and uh, they start asking if there's any credits there. They put holds on there. They, they basically forced him into foreclosure. Um, they forced him into bankruptcy. And he even lost his ability to get supplies at supply warehouses because he had to file foreclosure on his suppliers. I mean, it was just this financial mess constantly. And so there was all this fighting. And so I just grew up with that belief of like, why would anybody want to be a business owner when the IRS can come and just ruin your life? You know, and so that, that was it. That was basically my childhood it was just constant fighting, fighting to the point where like we were that neighborhood home where like the cops showed up every you know, once or twice a year. And, uh -huh. you know, there was like some real, some real bad things going on in the home. And, and uh, like literally kids weren't allowed to play at our house because, you know, we, we had the, you know, the home where the cops showed up to. <laughs> so it was kind of crazy, man. I love you parents, saying it all with a smile. <laughs> it yeah. just makes it so real. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, my parents aren't bad people. They're just, you know, they, man, they were just really ignorant and, you know, they just, you know, I don't know. They just got themselves in so much financial trouble. Is up over so buried them so deep. They just didn't know how to fight out of it. And so, and I didn't realize that either. Like I had that belief of, you know, man, that that's what business ownership is: is you're fighting the IRS all the time, and they just own you basically. Um, so it, it was pretty bad. But so I, I ended up because I've always been a real entrepreneurial kid. You know, I was that kid that would like scrub up you know, golf balls I found at the nearby golf courses and some of the golfers. I mean, I even would go down the hill to this mercantile we had growing up where I'd buy penny candies and they, when they were really a penny. I would put them in a baggie, 10 of them, and then I would go sell them at school for a dollar, you know? So I'm getting kids lunch money, like half their lunch money for a little bag of, of penny candies. And so I always loved that entrepreneurial. What's that? That their parents must have been pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I never really got any blowback for it. But I just loved the idea of making money, like turning my money into more money. And I loved the, you know, that entrepreneurial stuff before I even knew what entrepreneurship was. Um, so it was kind of a, a sad belief to grow up that like being a business owner was a bad thing. Um, so I got lucky because I got into sales. And uh, I got into sales for maybe about three years. And this guy comes into the company that I worked for and he does a presentation all about how to keep more of the money that you make, even as a sales guy for guys that had side hustles and side gigs and things like that, how to structure yourself and all these things. Uh, and I just really like gravitated to his presentation. And after talking to this guy a couple of times that owned an accounting firm, he ended up recruiting me to come work for him. And uh, this was a real big blessing for me because I dove head into the tax and accounting world. I learned as much as I possibly could from accountants at that firm. Um, mainly, the first reason was to obviously get more sales and know how to talk to my clients. I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could about accounting so I could onboard more clients and make more money. Um, but it kind of hit me like a freight train after I worked there for a couple of years that like, man, I want to be my own boss. I want to be my own business owner one day. And I now realize that like being a business owner isn't bad. Like I, I was just taught my whole life that being a business owner was bad and the taxes were bad and the government was bad and the IRS was bad, but it really wasn't. It was my dad's lack of obviously being organized and being structured and running his business effectively uh, that, that caused all the problems in our home growing up. And so it was really cool, man. Like I, I finally got the courage because once I learned everything about accounting, I learned systems and processes around accounting. I learned about structuring and uh, LLCs and S corps and C corps and sole proprietorship and partnerships. I learned all these things. Um, it, it gave me that confidence to go start my own business. So I did. I started, I continued working at the tax accounting firm, um, but I partnered with my buddy who wrote a course on day trading and uh, we partnered up and his course was really good. And so we partnered up and uh, on the side after hours, we would go and sell his course on how to day trade and make more money. I would do the sales and he would do the fulfillment and the coaching because he had more knowledge on that. 
and uh, it was pretty cool. It, it was it was a good gig. We did it for like a year, and then my boss pulled me in and he fired me uh, at the accounting firm. And he said, you know, if you're not here a hundred percent, you're not here at all. And I was like, what do you mean, man? I'm still like the number one onboarder. Like I know I get beat sometimes by this guy who I trained and brought in to the company. Like. You know, like I feel like I bring all this value and it was really hard because I loved this company and I loved the guys that I worked with. Um, but it was actually one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I remember he actually told me that. He's like, listen, man, you're on the fence and I'm kicking you off and you'll probably thank me one day. And so anyway, so uh, we ran our business for a couple of years uh, after I left that company. But I loved the tax and accounting game so much that I decided to start my own tax and accounting company on top of our day trading program company. And so that's what I did. And that became my main focus. That was in about 2008 that we started and launched our own tax and accounting firm. And uh, so here we are in 2019, 11 years later, um, you know, and that's, that's my main thing. It's my baby is, is I run the tax and accounting company. So that's awesome. So, so there's a few things I want to kind of bring out there because it, I think this is where most people tend to be. And I'm curious for yourself, why do you think that your parents didn't seek further education? Like why did they not go and ask a professional um, to help them? You know, man, I wish I had a really good answer for that. I, I don't know why they never did. I, I know my dad hired CPAs and then he would just never follow through with getting them the information to get caught up and get this problem taken care of. and. Uh, Man, I was like 19 years old before he finally did it. Um, but I think he got caught up in just the grind of constantly trying to make more money to get himself out of the hole and that he never really put the time and the focus into actually you know, solving that problem. He just kept trying to fix it by making more money, making more money, making more money, which just kept catching up to him. And, it, it, you know, and he did actually have some years where he made a lot of money, but then it was just more tax debt on top of more tax debt. And so I think he kind of thought literally like if he just stopped filing his taxes, like problems would go away and it didn't. So, yeah, no, and this is exactly why I want to bring this up because so many people, and I, I, I won't say I'm guilty of it entirely. If, if somebody understood what I was teaching, then, then maybe they would understand this, but maybe they don't understand. And that's why I'm glad I can, can shed some light on this. Some people believe that just making more money will solve all their problems. It'll help them get out of debt faster. It'll help them whatever. That is important, but there's other ways to make money. Because if we think of money as value, then um, you could go earn, trade time for money or value for money, whatever. You can go earn more money. Let's say you can go work for a day and earn $1,000. Right. Or you could spend a day saving $3,000 which is the most productive day. And people think, well, obviously earning more money, that's going to give me the best rate of return. And sometimes figuring out how to decrease expenses or not have to pay taxes on certain things, that's more valuable than the value of earning more money. And people don't always recognize that. And same thing with refinancing debt, refinancing um, car loans, credit cards, school debt, whatever it is. Sometimes repositioning stuff, there's a better rate of return on the reposition than on trying to earn more money. And that's not always the case, but in a lot of cases, it's definitely something that needs to be looked at um, and, and really gone over critically and think, okay, what's more important? I was talking with a client yesterday and he's like, well, I, all my family thinks I should go into this one investment. Like, that's fine. You can go into that investment and, and you will most certainly have a higher dollar amount in your account at the end of that investment than I will have in mine. But do you just want more money in your account or do you want to live on more income? Because in this other account, you can pull out twice as much without market risk. And so now the question is, I might have less money, dollars in my account at retirement, but I'm getting a third more income than you are. I'm getting 30% more income than the other person. So, so at that yeah. point, which is more valuable and really getting into the numbers and analyzing that, that's why professionals are valuable. Yeah. And it's good to have somebody who can help you understand, Hey, slow down. 
Maybe yep. money's not always the answer. Let's build a foundation that we can actually make money inside of, and you'll never have to worry about this again. Let's set up a structure to make that happen. So I'm curious, the next question is, when you were kind of going into getting into accounting, and I know you said you wanted to learn as much as you could to help other clients, were you connecting your purpose at that point back to your own childhood or was it still just like, Hey, this is a new thing and no connection to childhood at all? No, the, the only connection that I really had um, when I started to do my own thing was like, man, you know, I kind of had that epiphany of like, dude, you know, this is uh, very achievable to own your own business and not have those problems that your dad had growing up. My dad had. And, uh, and, and you know, those, those were the big connections that I had, but I didn't actually put it together until probably about four years ago that I was like, I really gravitate towards finance, finance and taxes and accounting for a reason. And I just, you know, kind of, it kind of just hit me one day when I really started thinking about why I like it so much. I was like, Man, it has to be because of my childhood, you know? So that actually didn't come till way later on. Like I just loved making money at something that I got good at. Um, and you know what I mean? All that. But then I started kind of putting it together that, that, uh, you know, I really enjoy it. And the reason is because I like solving these type of problems. I like being able to help people out of the problems that my dad was in. And I like helping prevent the problems that my dad got himself into. And to go back and even touch a little more on, on your point about, um, why, why he never got it taken care of is like, I think a lot of times, you know, we don't, learn a lot growing up in, in our school system about finance finance or or money management or anything and I think that he was just so ignorant to it and and absolutely did not like the idea of educating himself he just wanted to spend his time doing what he knew how to do and so I really feel like because people they procrastinate what they don't want to do they want to focus on what they know how to do and what brings in the money instead of like actually focusing on you know, taking care of those problems and in an area that they really know nothing about. He knew nothing about taxes. And I think that's why he avoided and procrastinated so much. So. Sure. And two, two things with that. One, I think that that, I think that's an okay perspective. If you're going to say, okay, I'm not going to focus on it, but I'm going to pay somebody else to focus on it. The yep. issue becomes when we're living in fear and scarcity and we're unwilling to pay somebody else to do their mm -hmm. expert work. I'm going to do my expert work. I was talking to a publisher just yesterday an editor and publisher, and it's like, okay, who, who do I talk to about formatting my books? Because could I learn how to format my own books? I absolutely could learn how to do that. That absolutely. is not something I want to become expert in. Like, I just don't. <laughs> who can I pay who's going to give me the best results? That's what I'm looking for. Um, how can I impart my, my value, my money to that person so that they can give me value back in return? Because I'm really good at what I do. It's okay if you're an expert, if you're just a, a genius at what you do, you do not need to be good at everything. You don't even need to think about everything past assigning it for somebody else. There's a great book called The E-Myth by uh, Mike, Michael Gerber, I believe. Yeah. Um, and that book is probably one of the best books to get that point across. Look, you were not meant to be a professional in every aspect of your business. You're meant to do whatever you're meant to do, whether it's the technician work, whether it's the business, whether it's the oversight work, whatever it is, that's what you're meant to do. Everything else, find somebody else who's professional and can do that so you don't even have to think about it or stress about it. And that's what I love about Kale is he is able to take that accounting stress, that bookkeeping stress, that really the, all the financial stress off of somebody uh, and take care of that. And then he can say, look, this is what you get every month <laughs> and yeah. then I can run your business. I'm curious, Kale, once that did click though, once you, you made the tie between your childhood and, and what you love doing and why you love mm -hmm. doing it, what changed in your business once that became, uh, once you became aware of that or how did you start treating your business differently? Everything changed, man, because, um, before, you know, I was running it like a business, like where can I, where can I cut costs and, and make more? And you know what I mean? Almost, um, you know, I'm just focused on making my business successful. And, and when I realized that I was like, you know what, I need to actually invest more into our fulfillment, more into our systems and processes, more in how we service clients, because the more money I help my clients save and the more service and value I add to them, the longer they're going to stay my customers. I'm going to have more, I'm, you know what I mean? I, I basically re 
you know, re-engineered it is like, instead of trying to figure out how to make more now, how can I make more in the long run by adding more value? And how can I actually help these people? We get more success stories now. We get more, I love what you brought up about your real estate client. We do a ton more amended reviews all the time. And we go back and find tens, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars that people can get back because of mistakes that were made either by a CPA or an accounting firm that really just didn't care or by a client trying to do it themselves. You know, so we love that. So we, we added, we started doubling down on services like that to start showing people how they can actually, the mistakes that they were making and how much they can actually save by doing some, some initial tax planning instead of just a bunch of projectional tax planning. And so that, that changed everything for us because it was just such a valuable service and people were getting such a good almost return on their investment with us that they now stay loyal customers with us for a lot longer. And then they want to hire us for more services like bookkeeping and tax preparation and all that. So, yeah, no, no. So, so a few things, um, the, the reason I asked that question of Kale, um, I didn't know how he was going to answer, but I know, um, a principle of truth. And the principle of truth is that when, what you what you're doing on a daily basis once you can connect that with your core identity and purpose things change you start looking at life differently you start looking at how you're serving differently and you heard him say it once he connected what he was doing with his core identity he added more value he started thinking how can i add more value how can i get more how can i give more of myself to to these people because un- until then it's all about money and there's a point where our our drive can be purchased by simply, I mean, Ed Milet is the, is the one who talks about this all the time. Like, when is your will to win going to be purchased? And everybody has a price. And to, to assume that you don't have a price, um, I think is a little bit mi- mistaken, um, b- but only when you're connecting it to money. Once you connect it to, to your identity, I don't think you have a price anymore. And that's the key thing. Once you can connect, once you can identify your identity and start building a business on that, that foundation of your identity, one, that's when you're all in. That's when your boss says, look, you got to get out because you're not all in here. That's when you're able to go all in. But also that's the value that you're adding is, is adding the identity. And then this, uh, this other thing, I want you to speak to this because uh, you're the professional, you have you're allowed to, I'm maybe not as much, but the perspective of people with taxes. Okay. So a lot of people think that taxes is something they have to pay and the government is dictating to them what they have to pay. They don't understand that every time you file a tax return, your, your tax return is essentially a proposal. It's a business proposal. Um, as if you were going to go into and like a flea market and say, okay, you have all that all this stuff that I want to buy, you think it's all worth $50. I want to give you 30. And then you could dicker over it until you come to, you settle on a price and that's what you end up walking out the door with. That is essentially what a tax return is. And if you don't, if you've been to Mexico, you've been to Ensenada, you've been on a cruise or to a, a third world country and you're not experienced barter and you're not experienced dickering with people, you're going to spend so much more money than somebody knows who knows how to wiggle somebody down on price. And that is the difference between an experienced accountant who understands what is actually happening and somebody who's trying to do it themselves. And don't do that to yourself because it's not you that's hurting. It's your family. It's your children. It's your parents. It's your grandparents. It's all the people who depend on you financially that you are um, not allowing the full benefit of a professional. Anyways, you, can, you can speak to that. Absolutely. Oh man, I love that analogy, dude. I actually, that's, I've never really heard it that way, but it's so true. Um, there's, and here's the thing too, to even touch a little bit more on that is, is like people don't realize that they don't have to really become tax experts to save a ton of money on their taxes. All they've got to do is spend a little bit of time communicating throughout the year. And, and a, lot of, a lot of work can be done. That's why we got the name Easier Accounting because even though the softwares are great, they take a lot off and they make things easier, people still don't, aren't willing to do it. Um, but once people actually take that step and they hire, whether it's us or somebody else, if they, if they find the right people for them that will actually take the initiative to help hold you accountable, to get the right information so that you do have professionals looking into your books, we can go through and find those things that we can negotiate with the IRS. You know what I mean? So like, Hey, you've got four kids and you've got them doing some duties of the business. Why don't we make them legitimate 
parts of the business so that you, one, you can teach them how to, um, you know, how business works and you can teach them valuable lessons on business and entrepreneurship, but why don't you actually start paying them the right way so that you can actually get the tax benefit on top of just your child tax credits. And now, and that's totally legal and legitimate as long as they are having a legitimate duty of the company. You know, like I've got clients that pay their younger kids just as Instagram models because there is Instagram models out there that make a substantial amount of money. And you can pay your kids up to $12,000 a year and they don't have to file a tax return. You don't have to do a W-2 on them. You don't have to do a 1099 on them. You don't have to do anything. You can just write it off as child labor. And then at the end of the day, you just wrote off 12,000 bucks. Now you use that 12,000 bucks to actually cover the expenses of your child. Baseball fees, school fees, clothes, groceries, portion of the rent, portion of those things that are not tax deductible in your life. So you're really getting like the tax deduction and using it to cover things that aren't tax deductible in your life, which is huge savings. So, I mean, there's just things like that, like just as for one example, there's also things with investing and things like that that we can show you throughout the year. And your accountant could do most of it for you if you're just willing to communicate with them. Yeah, because ultimately, and, and this is where people don't understand, like their lives as it, I see this on the financial side. So this is why I love this conversation. But all that's happening is it's the way that we're presenting the information to the IRS. All the numbers, mm-hmm. all the ones, all the zeros, all, everything's the same. All the money's flowing essentially the same way. The difference is how are we having that conversation with the IRS? What are we saying to them? Right? right? So delivery is key on in that conversation. And if you don't want to spend all year finding out, hey, how did the government change their, their preferred uh, language of delivery, then have somebody else do it. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. And people do not believe this, but I, I do promise you. And I'm not going to guarantee it because that would be against my, <laughs> my rules. But I will, I will say this. I have never seen somebody pay more in taxes by using an accountant. Every single time they save money and, and they're like, oh, well, it cost me $600 to file with an accountant or $1,200 a year or what. I paid, four, I paid $4,000 plus dollars a year for a good accountant and here's why. Because I know that that, that accountant is gonna save me at least four grand on my taxes, at least. And even if he doesn't, even if it's uh, zero, what I paid the accountant, um, and my tax refund versus if I just filed it myself and I had to pay more to the government, then this is, this is my position. Would you rather pay the government, the IRS? It's not even really the government if we're being completely honest. It's just the IRS. Uh-huh. Um, or would you rather pay somebody in your community? Like, what are you trying to support? Big, um, essentially a big corporation <laughs> or, <laughs> or somebody in your community? Even if you broke even, it's still better to support people in your community, I think. Oh yeah, dude. I totally agree with that. hundred uh, percent. But you I, we, you're the one getting the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, listen, man, a great accountant, someone that actually cares should never cost you any money. Like that's why we do amended reviews and initial tax planning with our clients when we bring them on board. Uh, and that's why we do things the way that we, we do things. Cause we want to show them, first of all, these are mistakes that are being made. And if we can't find mistakes that are being made, great. And we just gave you peace of mind. You can keep the guy that you have because, or the gal, you know, because you, you, you've got a good thing going. Like we can't find any mistakes, you know, but we also look at what industry you're in. What NACIS code are you in? Like what are the deductions that you are not implementing that you're eligible for? And do you have expenses in those areas? Because we want to also find out, are there money, are there things you're missing out on that we can now implement into your, your tax saving summary? And so, and we do that because we want to show people right out of the gate, like, we can save you this much money. And then we can add more value the longer you use us because it's like, okay, right now we're in the lowest tax rates in eight decades. Like we literally in the middle of a tax sale where rates are as low as they've ever been. So we don't want to continue to just do all these tax deferring strategies when we know almost 100% that tax rates are going to be a lot higher for our clients when they actually do go into retirement ages. So why do you want to defer a bunch of money right now that you're going to pay a higher tax rate on later? And then not only that, but then get your social security tax when you have to take your, you know, minimum withdrawals from your 401ks or your IRAs, you know, so we want to show people too, like, Hey, right now, take advantage of the investment strategies that are tax free in retirement age, you know, use the lower tax rates now to pay your taxes, save as much money as you can on your taxes, 
so that we can plan for the future and you actually can now live in retirement ages virtually tax-free or very minimally. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So when you're going through this and you're, you have this epiphany, you're going to change and you're saying, okay, I'm going to start my own business. Um, obviously you had the skills and this is where a lot of people think, well, I have the skills for somebody else, but I don't have the skills for myself. But not only do they think that for themselves, but oftentimes people around them don't believe that they could actually be successful starting their own business. So um, tell us a story of your biggest naysayer and how you were able to silence them in your mind and continue to progress and succeed regardless of what people were saying about you. My biggest naysayer? Hmm. I mean, that was probably me, you know. Um, I was my biggest naysayer. Um, and I was just, you know, I was a, I was a, before I even worked for the tax and accounting firm, I was just a sales guy and I made pretty good money. You know, I was making a hundred, 120 on up to even $150,000 a year in sales. And so I was paying a lot in taxes myself. That's one of the reasons I really liked that guy's presentation when he came to see us. Um, but I, man, even though I hated paying taxes, I hated the idea of my childhood. I hated the idea of getting myself into tax trouble. So I preferred to just have it taken out of my W-2. I preferred to have it taken out of my paycheck. I preferred never to be in those type of tax troubles. I liked that it was easy for me to go to H&R Block, which I actually did use. I used H&R Block when I was a sales guy. Um, so that, uh, sorry, someone tried to call no, in there. Uh, so that, uh, so, so that uh, I, I could just pay what I was owed and I would never get in those troubles. You know, so that's basically was my mindset. I want to make as much money as I can. I don't care what I got to pay in taxes. I just don't want those problems. Um, so probably before I even went to work for the tax and accounting firm, probably one of the biggest things that helped silence that is when I started working with this guy before I worked for him, he was my accountant. Um, I stopped going to H&R Block. I started going to him because he showed me that my wife, she was in an MLM business um, to make extra money. She was kind of a stay-at-home mom. And she wanted to make extra money. So she joined this MLM. He showed me that like, hey, you guys legitimately are trying to make money with this. It's not just some hobby. So you should structure yourself as an LLC and you should start keeping things separate and get organized and start, you know, money, managing your money a little bit differently because there's all these deductions that you're opening yourself up to. And I probably would have never went to work for him. And I probably would have never became a business owner if I wouldn't have learned those things from him, from the professional that I was getting advice from, because I started saving a significant amount of money on my, on my W-2 job because of all the tax deductions we were trading with my wife's home-based business at the time. And so I was actually like really blown away by it. like, wow, this is like, why do not more people know this? You know, why did my dad not know this? All that. And so that, that was probably one of the biggest moments where I was able to start silencing myself as my biggest naysayer and, and, and realize that like, dude, you don't have to be scared of the IRS. Awesome. I love it. So it, it's funny because we grow up as children, not everybody, but a lot of children grow up and they're scared of the dark, right? And I don't yeah. think that it's um, completely unwarranted to be scared of the dark. It's unknown. And it's kind of a natural reaction to be scared of the dark. But so, too often people take that physical example and they just limit it to the physical example. But in reality, psychologically, we're scared of the dark. We're scared of things we don't know. And to, to simply like silence the naysayers or get rid of some, a lot of those concerns in our lives, if we just expose ourselves to what is, then we don't have to be scared of what is anymore because now we know, right? There, there's, there's clarity there. And so I love that that is the, the way that you were able to silence you yourself as a naysayer is, hey, I just, I just needed more information. As soon as I got more information, yeah. then I was good to go. And I, I've seen that with my clients They'll, sometimes I'll question like, okay, is this really the best thing for me? I'm like, okay, I understand that you don't know what I know and that's fine. So here are some books that you can go read. If this is the way you need to do it, we need to expose you to more information, more third party sources, not coming from me so that you, you aren't sitting there thinking, oh man, I, uh, I probably should not do this. No, I want you to think, okay, how could I make this work? What, what does, what does Sam know that I don't know? I know I, 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 do my best never to assign malintent to somebody or that they're trying to screw me over or that they did something maliciously to hurt me financially. I, I just don't believe that. I think people um, in reality, they simply don't know what they don't know. They're yeah. acting on the best information that they have. And so if that's the case, how can I then bring somebody more information or how can I myself get more educated so that um, I don't have to worry about that again? So then what was, what would you say? I mean, cause that, all that takes tactical or, or, or some type of practical and application. What would you say uh, 
a habit, mindset, or behavior that you've adopted throughout your life has helped you create a, your meaningful legacy? What, what is a habit, mindset, or behavior of yours that's helped you do that? And then how could we adopt that into our lives? Um, yeah, I tell people all the time, you know, like I, I get on stages and present and stuff like that, just like you do. And, and I tell people all the time at the very end, I'm like, listen, you know, success is definitely a, a, a byproduct of execution, you know, and that's what I've always been really good at is just executing. I just do things right. Like before I even know if it's going to work or not, I don't overanalyze. I don't, um, I don't try and put together a perfect business plan or anything like that. When I have an idea of what I think is going to work, I just do it and find out right by through executing. But I tell people all the time, I'm like, listen, success. Yeah. You're going to get results from execution, but wealth, profit, those are not just events that happen. Like they are created through healthy habits. You have to start like getting things in order, like bookkeeping, the things that you don't want to do, you have to do them in order to know your numbers. And that's something that I had to do instead of just pitch, pitching it and, and saying it, I had to start practicing it. And so I'm very um, disciplined in my books now. So like I use my own service. I've got Jared, I got team Jared here, team Chris here, team Sean here, which are all bookkeeping teams. And they manage my books for my companies as well. We have several companies. I have my own S corporation. They manage my companies and they manage my S corporations. I look at my financials with them every month. And it only takes 20 minutes. You know, so are you willing to spend 20 minutes a month like understanding your numbers so that you can actually make better decisions in your business? So I had to start practicing what I preach. So I do that religiously now, monthly. I, I take the time to actually understand my numbers so that I can make better decisions in my business. So I've stopped just executing and hoping for the best return. And I started actually diving into my books and analyzing my numbers and making educated decisions based on financial information instead of just winging it. Yeah, I love that. It was for, for a long time when in my business, I would just uh, ask people general numbers like, okay, well, how much do you think this is, you're spending here, 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 here? Just get some general numbers, how much you're generally making what's your general expenses? Okay. So you have a discretionary income of about X, Y, Z or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what I found was, um, although that was fairly helpful, I mean, it, it accomplished my objective of being able to help them invest money. Um, it didn't really give them the education and the knowledge that they needed to really excel in life. And so um, same, same as you, once I shifted my mindset and got more in touch with my identity and what I want to do, I shifted my business model to now, my objective is before we ever even look at potential investment options, um, now the whole conversation is we've got to gain financial acuity. We have to get to a point where you know where every penny is, where it's coming in, where it's going, for the, at least for the last three months. We've got to factor in, if we're in the summer months, we've got to factor in that you're going to spend money on Christmas. And if, if you spend money on Christmas, how much is that generally? We've got to average these things out so that we're making good financial decisions. And then, and this is where my clients have given me really good feedback and I'm grateful for them is being able to do this process with zero judgment because it's not about what a professional thinks you should do with your money. It's not about what Kale thinks you should do with your taxes. It's about what do you value most? Right. And, and, and you can't have a value comparison or a value conversation until you know where your money's actually going. Once you know yeah. where your money's actually going, then I can say, okay, that money you spent on fast food, that money you spent on taxes, that money you spent on your car repairs, where was mm -hmm. the value, right? Yeah. Was it worth that much money? And if it wasn't, then we need to scale that back. If it was, and you think that that is your football season is totally worth your subscription to ESPN or whatever, and that's your sanity, dude, I'm not telling you to scrap that. If that's what's keeping right. you sane, you need that. You need mental health. Yeah. But, but understand that there is, there, we have to have a value conversation about every dollar and say, am I getting the value? Am I getting the mileage out of this dollar? If not, let's, let's, let's reallocate it somewhere that's better, that's going to give us more value. Yeah, I love that that's what you do too, man, because we're always looking at people spending like, okay, well, what's tax deductible and, and what isn't and what can we run through your company account and how can we save you more money on your taxes based on what you are spending? But I love that you are helping people like find that value in their money. Like what can you legitimately cut? What is the value? Because that is a huge part of it. Budgeting is a big part of it. Um, but you know, like we, we look more at what is tax deductible? How can you shift your money, move your money in order to make it the best? for your taxes, you're looking at it like, what can you do for your life? Because at the end of the day, like everybody's goals are the same, you know, everyone's goals are different, 
but they all come down to the same thing because I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of business owners over the years and everybody wants the same thing. They want value of time. They don't want money to dictate the decisions in their life. They want to reach a point in their life where they have absolute financial freedom. Every single goal I ever hear from guys, pay off my mortgage, have financial freedom, travel the world more. Everything all comes down to that. Like they don't want money to dictate their decisions on what they do with their time. That's what it all comes down to. And they have to create those habits of like what you do, budgeting, and then they have to create better financial habits with their accounting and everything if they really want that end goal. Yeah, and 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 this is another thing that's really important here to, to analyze is so many people that I talk to, and you probably talk to people similar, where you start asking them questions about their money and they say, oh, well, I have an accountant. And, and they think the accountant is the end all be all for everything they need. Or they say, oh, I have a bookkeeper. Or, oh, my, my uncle is, does, files all my taxes for me. Or my mm-hmm. uncle's a financial advisor. Or my, my uncle has been really successful with his investments. Or he's a business owner, right? And they think that they only need one person to manage everything. And no, no professional that I would consider a professional is going to say that they do everything. Um, yeah. Every professional that I've met that I would consider a professional, they're part of a team. They're part of okay, how are we as a group going to maximize this? So on my team, I have lawyers, I have accountants, I have Mm -hmm. other financial professionals, I have people who manage debt, I have people who help eliminate debt, I have people who can get, like help you get into more debt if you're looking to expand your company, right? Like I have a team of people that I work with and I provide one little area. It's important for me to understand how I'm working with all of them so I understand overall strategies when it comes yeah. down to licenses, when it comes down to actual application and implementation, I only do a sliver of what has to get done. Mm-hmm. And, and so if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, well, I, I have somebody who takes care of this one little thing. Even though Kale and I do similar things for our clients, we each are, are striving for a different objective and, and we're each going to pull a little different corner in, in the ring for our client. And sometimes we may agree or disagree with how to move forward with the client. And that's part of negotiation and say, okay, what, what is actually the best way forward in, uh, in the interest of this client? And there's things that he might not be aware of that I know. And there's things that I might not be aware of that he knows. And that's why we have a team of people because a team is better than one. And I think that's important for people to understand. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's a good problem to have. If you've got, if you've got a couple of different experts kind of going back and forth on what really is best for you and what a lot to align with your goals at the end, like that's a pretty good problem to have. So you should have multiple experts looking at things. And, and I tell people that all the time. I'm like, hire the right people for you. How do you do that? Interview them. Talk to them. Like you wouldn't just hire anybody to fill a very important role in your company without interviewing them and getting multiple interviews. Like you want the right person for your team. And it's got to be the same thing with your, with your accountant. Don't hire me if I can't do what you need me to do. Uh, and you're not going to find that out unless you talk to me. But don't just go hire your uncle's best friend because he saved your uncle a bunch of money. You know, you guys are in two totally different situations. There is no cookie cutter approach to accounting. Uh, budgeting anything because everybody is totally different when it comes to that. Yeah, I even I even know a uh, a client that he actually pays three completely separate uh, independent accounting firms to track and do his numbers every year, and he just files the best one out of the three that he likes. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> so, so, anyways, but that it's really fascinating. Like what is the value of having experts in your corner and everybody's going to do it a little bit different. Everybody studied different with different things because of their clientele. They have different knowledge uh, and they've done different things. They've been successful with different things. And so it's just funny when he told me that I was like, that's actually really smart um, to say, Hey, look, everybody go work on this case. And um, when you come back with your, I mean, I think of like a, oh, what's the, is it Potiphar in the story about, no, nah, I don't know who it was. Somebody in the story of Joseph in Egypt, when he wanted his dream interpreted, he like went and got all of the wise men to interpret the dream and then come back. And they all got a chance to like say their interpretation. And then he's like, yeah, I don't like any of those. Is there anybody else I can interpret it? 
<laughs> but it's real. It really can be like that. It's like it's okay to have multiple opinions and multiple perspectives. I'm not offended when somebody wants multiple perspectives about what I think the role is um, or the or the plan. I'm obviously yeah. going to fight for my strategy hard because I think it's the best or else I wouldn't yeah. have ended it, right? Yeah, you believe in it for sure. Right. So, so how, what does it look like if we were to call you or, or reach out to you, easier accounting on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Kale Goodman, um, what does the process look like working with you? I know pricing is going to be variant based on who, mm -hmm. what the situation is, but what does the process look like? Yeah. Um, so the process here is it is, it's, it's kind of uh, different based on what you need. Like we have clients that call us that they're, they're tired of their accountant, not calling them back or, you know, communications poor. We have clients that just feel like they were, they're overpaying. Um, and so we get clients from all over. We go to events like you do. We have people approach us at events and after events. Um, but based on what the client's telling us is, is the road that we're going to take them down. Like, if people are like, oh man, I just want to see if you can save me money first and you know, whatever, like before I, before I hire you or whatever, which is fine. We're totally fine with that. Um, well then we are going to talk to them about like, well, let's do a, let's do an initial tax plan. Okay. I'm not going to do a lot of people, first of all, don't even tax plan at all. Um, so we're going to say, okay, well, well what we do, we have a tax plan product, which is a thousand bucks and uh, we do a $2,000 guarantee on it. So if we can't show you has your accounting sits right now, not on future predictions, not all that stuff, not future investments and how to defer money, none of that stuff. If we can't show you in your accounting how we can save you at least $2,000 right now as your accounting sits, we'll give you money back and you can go back to your accountant at least you have peace of mind. If we can show you at least $1,000 of the savings on top of what you paid us, then, then uh, sorry, someone keeps trying to call me. Uh, then, uh, then, then uh, you, you're going you're gonna to see. And so our tax plan is based around an amended review. We're going to look at your past two years' taxes. We're going to analyze all the mistakes that we're finding. We're going to look at your industry, like I talked about before. What can we implement to add more value and a summary, basically, of if you fix this, if you add this, you will save this. And so we do that with a lot of our clients initially, but a lot of clients just call us up and they're like, dude, my books are eight months behind. I'm sick of it. I'm trying to get a loan. The bank wants to see financials. Can you guys help me? How quick can you help me? And so we, you know, we have a team of, of bookkeeping experts where they'll jump in, dive into your books. They'll look at what you do have or if you have anything. If you don't have anything, they'll look at your bank statements for your business banking, your personal to determine what is the workload for this client. We don't charge people based on how much money they make and how much money they net. We charge people based on what is it going to take us to service this client every month. Three hours, four hours, five hours, and then we build our quote around that. That way, we don't care if someone's making $2 million a year and they're netting you know, a million of it, we're not going to just be like, man, how, how can we get as much money as we can out of this client? We don't do that stuff. We look at how many hours is it going to take. That guy might have only, you know, 150 transactions for the entire year. So his bookkeeping is going to be pretty cheap, even though he's a million dollar client, a million, a millionaire, you know, I mean, we might have someone that makes two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year, but they're not netting very much, but they also have a crap load of, of uh, transactions going through their bank accounts and their and we're going to hook our cloud-based software up to it. Maybe they're handwriting checks. Now we got to check, check images in order to properly categorize. And so there's like all these things that we got to do. And so if that takes more time, it's going to cost you more, even though you make less money than the millionaire that's paying us less. It's all in how, how much time is it going to take to service you. And we are going to find ways to help clean that up as well and, and uh, give you better savings on your accounting. So, Yeah, no, I think that, that is, it's key to understand kind of what that process looks like um, because a lot of people, they're scared of the unknown. I and mean, we've already talked about this. They're scared of the unknown. So when we can eliminate some of those barriers, what is it, is it, is it like a one and done type thing or is it a continued relationship um, of, of saving? Like what, for you, what, what, do you, what type of clients are you looking for? Because I know there's a lot of yeah. people out there and, and I want to make sure that the people listening to this know exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. So calling in and wasting your time. We do get a ton of people referred to us in startup phase of their business. Um, so a lot of times they, they can't afford like an ongoing expense. So we just try and do our best to advise them. Uh, but we will do one-time services. So if someone needs an LLC set up, an S corp, multiple LLCs, whatever it is, you know, we have those one-time services where we can form those entity docs for you and make sure that they're set up properly from a tax standpoint. Um, we have tax planning, which is just kind of a one-time service unless you want ongoing tax planning. Um, so we do have those one and done type services and, and sometimes people go out of business, it doesn't work out. We don't hear from them and they, other than if they want to dissolve that entity later on, you know, which we'll do. Um, but 
we do we do aim to earn the long term clients. So we like guys that are in their first two, three, four, five years in business that haven't gained a whole lot of of financial expertise. They're they are pretty ignorant, but they don't want to get into those tax troubles and those tax burdens that people like my dad had growing up. We love those type of clients because we know we can help them solve a lot of problems before they even happen. Uh, but yeah, we want them on our bookkeeping services and our tax prep services. We roll we roll our tax prep everything into like a membership style. So if we have someone that's bookkeeping, tax preparation, ongoing tax planning, which is a great product, um, we also throw in unlimited tax consulting. So we're not like your traditional accounting firm or CPA firm where every time you call us, you know, you get an hourly bill like an attorney. You know, we give unlimited tax consulting. So if you are because your business is going to be ever changing. Like if you're, if you're out trying to buy a new vehicle for maybe your plumbing business or something like, or maybe it's a personal vehicle, but you are going to use it partially for business. What is the best thing to do? Well, let me call my accountant over at easier accounting. Let me see if I can, you know, lease this vehicle. Is that a better tax write off or should I purchase it? You know, what's the deduction? What's the difference? How much is it going to save me? What are my options? And so we do, we get people that use us for those type of scenarios all the time. Um, but that's why we throw unlimited tax consulting into all of our membership packages. Yeah, I, I love that. Cool. So this is, where, where's the best place to connect with you? Is it online, Instagram? Yeah. Like, where's the best place to contact you guys? Um, yeah, so we do, we do have an Instagram, Easier Accounting. We also have one where we do just business advice and, and things like that as well. On top of just accounting, it's called At Real Business Owners. Um, that's all on Instagram. But most people contact us through our website. You can get on there and chat. You can look up our phone number. You can come see us. Um, it's just easieraccounting.com. Um, and then you can, yeah, you can also always just give us a call. Our number is 888-620-0770. But, um, but yeah, no, most people get online, they chat with us or they call and set up a time with us, you know, reach out to us. So, um, but they can find us on social media and online as well. So awesome. Love it. So this is uh, the second favorite part of the whole episode right now. It's called Legacy on Rapid Fire. I'm looking for one word to one sentence answers to these questions. Okay, it's five questions. Um, first question is, what do you believe is holding you back from reaching the next level of your legacy today? What is holding me back? Um, I have to allow myself to give up control. In some of the areas that I am head of, I've got to start creating systems for someone to replace me so I can work on other things in my business as well. Awesome. And what do you think the hardest thing you've ever accomplished has been? The hardest thing I've ever accomplished? Hmm. Man, you know what? My family. Um, I went through my very first marriage. I'm on my second marriage right now. And I went through uh, a really bad marriage. You know, I grew up in a bad marriage and there was a lot of bad habits there. And there was a lot of, you know, a lot, of, a lot of bad things that I had to fix. And so I had to get my ego in check. I got therapy for years with my wife trying to make that marriage work. It didn't work. I continued going. And now like a lot of people tell me, well, the grass isn't going to be greener on the other side. But at the end of the day, it is if you choose for it to be like, I put a lot of work into fixing me so that I could be a better business owner, a better husband, a better father, everything. I put a lot of work into that, years and years of, of working on me. Um, but my family is happy. We, we, have, we have so much gratitude in our home, but it wasn't easy. I had to totally shift who I was to accomplish that. Yeah, that's awesome. And what do you think the greatest success at this point in your life has been? Oh man, maybe I should use the family for that one. <laughs> ah. You still can um, for both if you, if you want. It can be. Yeah, both. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, that is my real why. That is my real passion is, is my family, man. Like that's where my, my 100% of my effort is. It's the reason I do what I do. Um, but I absolutely love, I, I love helping other people too. You know, that, that is a huge part of my passion as well. And I love what we've built here. We've built a culture in our company that every single person you talk to wants to help you. They don't just want to get you off the phone. They want to give you the time that you need, the advice that you need. So I love the culture that we've built. So from a business standpoint, I love the culture that we've built here. That's, That's awesome. Little, yeah. So what is one secret that you believe contributes most to your success? Um, other people, man. Um, you can't do it alone. And so I had to become a better leader and get people to buy into what I was doing, what my mission was, what my vision was in order to create the success, not only for us, but for our clients and our company. Um, and so I think that you, you've got to be a great leader. 
and get people to buy into you and your vision and, and back it up too. You can't just get people to buy into something that you don't fully believe in. Back it up, you know, like actions speak louder than words, right? Absolutely. No, that's awesome. So what, uh, if you had uh, two or three books that you would recommend to the Fuel Your Legacy audience, uh, what would you recommend? Yeah, so um, one of my first books that I read was um, – the Asset Protection Bible by Jay Mitten because I want to understand more about entities and how they can protect me from a legal standpoint and how they can help me from a tax standpoint. And he covers a lot of that. Um, and and also in my early days, I learned a ton on Diane Kennedy's Loopholes of the Rich. Um, and I read these books because I wanted to be better at my onboarding process for the company I worked for that was accounting firm before I owned my, or my own. And so if you're looking for more tax knowledge, dude, that's a great book. Um, and then recently... A recent book was Power of Zero. I love how he breaks down in simple language how people can start planning for the future. And that's why I talked a little bit about the podcast about like, dude, like we're in the lowest tax rates in decades right now. We need to take advantage of that because it's not going to stay that way. The way that Congress has it uh, to where it's going to automatically go back up in 2026 and it's probably going to go higher there because of the national debt crisis and everything else. Like it, it helps you understand like what you need to be doing right now and taking advantage of the time right now with the situation that we're in as a country and our tax rates. So I think that's a huge thing to understand to get ahead of the game in your finances too. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So this is the favorite question of the whole episode. This is why I say it for last, but it's because we get to pretend that you're dead, which is always okay. nice, right? You're excited about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but it's, it's about legacy. And so the, the question is, if, if you were to pretend that you're dead and we're, you got the opportunity to kind of view your great, 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 great grandchildren, so six generations away from now, they're sitting around the table discussing your life. They're discussing the legacy that you left. What do you want them to be saying six generations from now about you? Um, man, hopefully they're saying, I wish grandpa was still alive so that I could ask, uh, uh, pick his brain on some things, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, cause that is, that is one of my goals, man. Like I want to be that pillar of my family. I want to be the guy that can give actual wisdom to my kids and my kids, kids and, and, uh, everything else, man. Like I, I hope that I can pass information down from generation to generation that benefits my entire family for decades to come. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I, that, that really is my goal. At the end of the day, I've been asked a question about what my ultimate goal is. And it's like, it's not a dollar figure. It's not, it's not a, a certain amount to sell my business for. It's not any of these crazy things right now. It's like wisdom. Like what can I offer, uh, in the, you know, for my generations to come of my family. And so that is going to be the ultimate level of, of success for me is like, what, what kind of family have I created? What kind of, what are they adding to the world as well? Um, and so that, that, that is my ultimate goal. Um, but hopefully, hopefully they're saying, you know, and hopefully with social media and everything like that, they actually get the opportunity to go back and look at that kind of stuff. Like everybody should be like posting and uh, sharing their story online now, because that is the people who are going to be looking at it, is the generations to come, the, the people that are your great, great, great grandchildren. And hopefully there's a lot to learn there, but hopefully, hopefully that, hopefully they're looking back and saying, wow, like what a great example we had in our family and how much he was able to teach my dad and my dad's dad and everything else. So, and I wish he was still here so I could pick his brain as well. Yeah, that is awesome. I love this whole episode. I love everything about it. Uh, I'm super grateful. Kale is actually going to be speaking with me at door to door con um, in January. So super excited to, to really get to jive. We're going to be on the same stage, same room, talking about finance, you know, making sure that uh, people can understand and implement some, some mm -hmm. tactical things to change their life. If you are in any form of that industry, any sales industry, um, it doesn't have to be door to door. It's any person to person or business to business industry. Door to door con is going to have some major, major players. Ed Milet, Tim Grover, um, John Stockton, I think is his name. Oh, wow. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people going to be, be there who are heavy, heavy hitters in not just the, the personal development sphere, but business in, in general. There are major leaders in, in business, and they're going to be there speaking. You don't want to miss it. The, the tickets are not that expensive for 
for what you're getting. It's going to be at Salt yeah. Palace in Salt Lake on, I believe, the 16th through the 18th of January. I mean, yeah. You're not going to want to miss that. But Kale and I will be there jamming it up on stage. I'm and, excited, man. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a good time. And then also we'll have some booths there that we can, uh, if, you, if you're interested in kind of talking more one-on-one, we'll be there to chat about that. And yeah, just super excited. Uh, Me too, so man. grateful for you and for your time that you've taken out of your day to be on the Fuel Your Legacy podcast and add that value. Um, some people's lives are going to change, which is going to be awesome. So My pleasure, man. I can't wait to share some things about our episode today and uh, you know, hopefully get you on our podcast in your future as well, dude. Love that. Yeah. So. I love that as well. Well, thank you so much and we'll catch you guys next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Legacy.